also very honored to be invited to come. Um, this is primarily a tutorial effect um, intended to introduce bayonets uh, to people who haven't encountered them before, perhaps have heard about them, and so on. So I know many of you know about bayonets. Um, so to spice it up for those, um, what I've enjoyed most in the past couple of days coming out of philosophy are these philosophical arguments that people have been having. So I, I propose to continue in that fine tradition. So I've added a, a number of slides at the front uh, to provoke you in, into moral outrage, perhaps. <laughs> so I'll start off with advertising. This is my book. Um, today's talk and tomorrow's talk are really just distillations of part one and part two of this book. So today is introducing Bayesianets and a little bit of philosophy of probability. And tomorrow I'll talk about causal discovery of Bayesianets, which is a, a booming um, area. Um, well, Bayesianets in general are booming. The, the Moore's law, however slow it may be relative to some, is fast enough to, to bring computational capacity in uh, that, that's fairly substantial to, to most of us. And, and that's, I think, what really has set up both stochastic techniques, which are widely used in the Bayesian net world, and, and Bayesian computation in general. Don't want it to my way. So anyway, um, this is meant to be quite an accessible um, introduction. So part one is Bayesian net, part two causal discovery, and part three is applications, how, how to apply these things in the real world, uh, solving real problems. And uh, so I'll connect this to the Institute so that anyone who wishes can have a, have a look. It's mostly because I don't want to carry that. <laughs> Another advertisement. Australasian Basin Network Modeling Society. I helped organize this a few years back. Um, it seems to be very much in, in the same direction as this meeting. That is, it's, it's an application's of uh, Bayesianet society, effectively. So we have um, all kinds of different people in, engaged in it, um, medical researchers, uh, environmental managers, um, ecologists, and so on. Uh, so we have a yearly meeting, we have a society, we try to keep a, a little bit of a multi-log going um, inside Australia primarily. But the reason I'm advertising it is that we're lonely. We're, we're the only such society in the world that we know of and would really like to encourage other societies to, to organize themselves and, and to uh, affiliate with us and get a worldwide network going of people uh, interested in Bayesian networks and their application to real world problems. So if, if people in India would like to do that, would be we, we would love to make the Asian actually mean something. Okay, so to start off, um, the certainty of uncertainty. I, I'm, Presumably, I'm speaking to uh, primarily at least semi-committed Bayesians of different varieties. But nonetheless, I'll go through some of the motivational material. So there are three basic, I mean, there are no doubt others, but these are the three main um, sources of uncertainty um, in, in my worldview. Anyway, the, the laws of physics and, and other laws governing the way the world works um, may well themselves be stochastic. And in fact, a lot of our most successful theories are stochastic, such as genetics, economics, and so on. Another source of un uncertainty is just that uh, our measurement apparatus is limited, um, or we don't even know what to measure. Uh, so there's the operation, the causal operation of, of features of the world um, that may well be deterministic, but from the point of view of what we can actually observe, behave as though stochastic. And then there's measurement error itself, which creeps into every kind of measurement in the early days of machine learning, until around 1990, measurement error was pretty much completely ignored. <coughs> it's a kind of odd thing in the history of, of AI. But, but, but even before that, the, the, the whole history of the study of causality has been a deterministic study until, um, until Hans Reichenbach, until he started looking at um, stochastic ways of, of interpreting causality. So that's uh, 2,000 years of belief in determinism, which is pretty strange, since uncertainty is really all around us. Impossible to ignore if you're actually paying any attention. So anyway, the basic proposal is there's, there's this uncertainty everywhere. We've got to cope with it somehow or other. So why not use probabilities to cope with the uncertainties we have to deal with? That, I take it, is the heart of Bayesianism. And, and some people, of course, may disagree. So we'll see. Um, this is what it was invented for. Of course, there are people outside of the Bayesian world who disagree. There's, there's the fuzzy stuff of Zyda and, and other things. I'll refer to a, 
few of them along the way. Um, but the Bayesian claim is that they don't do nearly uh, as good a job. And indeed, they go demonstrably wrong in, in many cases. Um, so justifications. Well, Cox has a justification wherein he drives uh, the axioms of probability from a couple of uh, very simple uh, assumptions. Um, and, and that's meant to somehow support the probability axioms as a way of dealing with uncertainty because these are desiderata of any way of dealing with uncertainty. Um, it doesn't really do a lot for me simply because you can drive um, in either direction and the probability axioms are already simple enough for me. So, but whatever. The real point might be that any attempt to, any reasonable attempt to formalize reasoning about uncertainty is likely to turn out to be equivalent sort of like uh, the church Turing thesis in computation. For me, uh, a more compelling sort of argument are the Dutch book arguments due to Ramsey, um, that if you're willing to take a sequence of fair bets, a finite sequence of fair bets um, in any direction, uh, then demonstrably you're insane if you violate the probability axioms in establishing what is or is not a fair bet. So here, betting is, in, in the basic argument, it's, it's literal, literal betting, but actually the, the Bayesian point of view is that we take it as an analogy for living our lives. Um, crossing the street and rolling in a, in a um, course of study or whatever, you're making bets about what you get out of that or what you won't get out of that. Here's the dubious Bayes. Dubious because I'm known, of course, but I, I think Bayesians ought to accept this as a kind of logo. Um, unless it's simply disproved to, to not have originated from Bayes, then fine. But in the meantime, uh, I, I prefer it to Laplace. Okay, so there's Bayes' theorem. We all know and love this, right? So we have the probability of a hypothesis given the evidence is equal to this other thing. That's, that's the reason that statement, taking H as hypothesis and E as evidence, that's the reason why Bayes' theorem is of real interest. If it's just the probability of A given B, it's, it's basically just a trivial theorem of a, a, uh, that falls out of the calculus immediately. But the Bayesian interpretation goes a bit further. It's, it's not, this really just is a theorem, of course, and it's utterly trivial to prove. Um, conditionalization is not a theorem, and not only is it not trivial to prove, it's not provable because it's invalid. Um, what does it say? It says that we should, under some circumstances, get to be identified, jump from the current probability distribution that we had that was joint over the evidence in the hypothesis space, using the conditional on the evidence that was observed, we should adopt an entirely new probability distribution that just omits E, we drop E. So that's P prime for the posterior. Why would we want to do a thing like that? Well, there are some Bayesians, perhaps many Bayesians around, who think we shouldn't do anything like that. We should just operate with the probabilities that we start with. And as we add evidence, we simply add a comma. After the E, we get an E prime and an E double prime, and so on and so forth, forever and ever. The problem with that is that Bayesian computation, or probabilistic computation in general, is exponentially complex in the number of variables you're dealing with. So unless you have an extremely big head, there's going to be a very short limit to how many variables you can simultaneously compute with. So as an approximation to truly correct inference, which is computationally intractable, um, the suggestion in conditionalization is that whenever we become reasonably well convinced that E describes the truth about the world, that we should conditionalize and drop E. And there's a more general argument that whenever the posterior probability of any statement, hypothesis, evidence, whatever, uh, gets sufficiently high within a certain domain um, so that the, the, the disutility of making mistakes, reasoning about it as if true, um, are sufficiently um, within, can be dealt with, then you just accept H and drop the distribution. And you start with an inferior calculus called logic, inferior to probability calculus. Anyway, that's that's a whole set of arguments Sorry. revolving around the probability, philosophy of probability, which I probably won't get into in this Eric Forces meeting. No, no, I, I, it seems to me that 
one drop space when whatever next thing you want to do with this probability distribution, you are convinced that uh, the likelihood of anything happening depends only on H and not also on the previous evidence E that you use to arrive at your current posterior for H. And so if that's something that you're willing to assume, then, yeah. you, then, then you're justified dropping A. If it's not dropping E. Otherwise, you know, E will also still influence whatever further inferences you want to do. Is, is yeah, that's, 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 a, that's a possible point of view. Another, another thing to say is that when, when the, probability of, the posterior probability of E is, is almost 1, then reasoning along with it in, in a probabilistic framework is a waste of time and complexity. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, um, for conditionalization, there's always been a couple of basic assumptions that have been explicitly discussed. So, first of all, you have to have joint priors over your hypothesis space and your evidence. And secondly, you have to have total evidence. Um, e and only E is learned. Strictly speaking, total evidence is, is probably impossible to satisfy. So, so it's, it's all idealization. Okay, so why, why conditionalize however you went over that? Um, but there certainly there are limits to conditionalization. So first of all, fallibilism. It's atypical for the posterior probability of anything to be one, whether observation or not. There, there is a long tradition in philosophy of science of trying somehow to make posterior probabilities of evidence be one. That that's, comes out of the logical positivist tradition. They talked about sense data. Um, so they tried to make sense of a, an observation language where we could be absolutely certain that the statements in the language are true or absolutely certain that they're false. So what were the statements like? Well, that was one of the problems. They never actually came up with any such language. But just to give you a feel for it, they started talking about things like um, red patch now. That's supposed to be a sentence. Red patch now. Um, what, what color is this? Off-white. Just call it off-white. Off-white now. Does everyone agree? Could you possibly be mistaken about that? Well, yes, you could. Come on, don't shake your head now. Or is that yes? I'm confused. Um, you could be mistaken about it for all kinds of reasons, like the lighting is bad, or you're hallucinating, or or you're just you just find it safe, or something like that. There are all kinds of reasons why. Well, in any event, the whole business of even coming up with a language, let alone accounting for how we can have infallible knowledge about it, failed. So we certainly do have observations. We have common sense, middle range sorts of observations, like who's sitting in, in the seat in the front row. Okay? I don't have any special doubt about that. But I'm not going to say that it's infallibly true. I mean, there are all kinds of things that could make it false, despite my experiences at the moment. So here's Richard Jeffrey's example. Uh, of the kinds of things that can go wrong. I mean, you might be looking at a handkerchief in a half light. You're pretty sure it's yellow, but not really, because it could be like orangish or, or light yellow green or something like that. So you don't really know what the color is, but you would like to conditionalize over its being yellow. Well, instead of, um, instead of just saying the probability of it being yellow is one, which would be absurd in the circumstances, you can just attribute some lesser probability to it. Conditionalization then doesn't work, and in fact, Jeffrey was not strongly in favor of conditionalization. He offered this, this generalization of conditionalization, so the posterior probability of the hypothesis should be a mixture of its probabilities under the evidence and under the negation of the evidence <coughs> weighted by their posterior probabilities. And, and that works perfectly fine as an alternative to conditionalization, and, and it's certainly more justifiable in many, most circumstances. Okay, so these considerations suggest that Nazo's not here, so I can go ahead and take shots at him. Or did he sneak into the back? Okay. Um, so anyway, the, the idea of segregating out a certain history with a semicolon H is completely unwarranted and, and usually wrong -headed. And I'll go ahead and take a shot at Popper as well. Popper was wrong about almost everything in philosophy of science, but, but not about this. Three limitations, so there's another limitation. We cannot plausibly be only conditionalizing. If you take conditionalization as your only rule of inference, right, then what you're really positing that is that as soon as somebody is identified as a Bayesian agent, let's say, I don't know what age, three months? What, what, is, what is agency? I mean, forget about the law. 
there's an issue about abortion, but when does agency get uh, justifiably conferred on an individual? I just realized, because I've never heard this argument before, that I have a question. So why, so I understand that you're never really sure what of the evidence, what it really says. Yeah. Can this go in your likelihood function? And say, so let's say some experiment <coughs> just sends me data, right? This happens all the time. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. You can be five. represented. You can be represented in your likelihood function. That's right. But but the the point still remains that you can't use the conditionalization rule as long as you don't have a probability of one. Anyway, moving on. i will be happy to, if you have things to take up that are kind of tangential. I would love arguing, and I'll be <laughs> overjoyed to argue over dinner but with you or anybody. I take on all comers. Anyways. Um, so anyway, conditionalization can't be happening, can't be the only story, because otherwise, as soon as you have this infinite infant who counts as a Bayesian agent, then what you're proposing is that that infant already has a joint distribution over everything that it's ever going to reason about in the rest of its life, and then it just conditionalizes. But that's absurd. That's just obviously absurd. Maturation counts for something. Um, well, any change in the brain counts for something. Of course, Bayesian is meant to be an ideal, but, but that's still an absurd ideal. So Bayesian principles, Bayesian conditionalization needs supplementation. It definitely needs supplementation. And it's going to be supplemented on grounds that are beyond the scope of any Dutch book argument or any such argument. And that works, it's going to be non-Bayesian supplementation. You can claim it's Bayesian. You can claim Max Ent is Bayesian. But Max Ent is an extra principle you throw into Bayesianism. Or you don't, as the case may be. It helps to find what kind of a Bayesian you are. I'll take you off of that. OK, that'll be good, especially if you pick from here. <laughs> OK, another problem with conditionalization is, like I said, it's actually just an invalid inference rule. Well, it's more than just an invalid inference rule. There are invalid inference rules that are useful and invalid inference rules that are useless. And this is one that's useful. OK, but strictly speaking, you can't really do it work conditionalization unless you adopt some further assumptions, and minimally, that your conditional distribution your conditional uh, probabilities there are not being affected by the observation. If you accept that this conditional might vary, so there's an inequality, then conditionalization goes to hell. So why might that happen? Well, ha Housen has a, a number of uh, amusing logical examples which I've forgotten, so I can't tell you. I um, have to look it up again. But here's, here's an example. Um, you might start out saying that it, you know, just, just in the imagination, okay, suppose someday I eat the very best meal ever in my life, the absolute best meal in my life. Then the next day, I'm probably going to be pretty happy. I'm going to be contented. I'm going to reflect on the meal. Everything will be happy. And then I discover that I'm eating the best meal ever in my life, and I'm in death row in Texas, and I'm eating the best meal because I'm about to get executed. So the probability that I'm going to be happy tomorrow has suddenly plummeted to something like zero. I mean, unless you believe in afterlife, which I don't. OK, so I'm not going to accept any longer this conditional probability. That means I'm refusing to condition it. So according to some basins, I'm radically irrational. Of course, you could say that you've learned more than you've just eaten the best meal. You've also learned that you're in death row, et cetera, et cetera. But I can still say the argument against conditionalization in this case if you suppose that you never even entertained the idea that you might end up on death row, then at some point or other you're going to have to violate conditionalization between not entertaining that and discovering that you are on death row. We can't be certain you won't exist on day two, right? Like you said, you can't rule out the possibility that you won't exist on day two. Well, there's always the possibility, and I notice I didn't put probability one here. Okay, so it accounts for being hit by a truck and stuff like that. But if I'm just eating a normal, happy, wonderful meal, I'm not going to raise the probability that I get hit by a truck unless, unless I get a company uh, it's with, with beer and stuff. OK, anyway. So, so there are problems with conditionalization. You can't just apply it willy-nilly without thinking about it. Um, there are restrictions. On the other hand, it's, it's just very often useful. Certainly in scientific settings where you have, in advance, figured out what the experiment's going to, perform, how you're going to perform the experiment, what evidence statements are likely, and so forth then you can go ahead and, and use it, typically. So anti-Bayesians, they often attack the two basic assumptions. Where am I? <coughs> Sorry. Um, joint priors, priors are hard to come by. They're, they're always complaining about that, in fact. Where do the numbers come from? 
the way it was put to me early in my career. And of course, total evidence as well. Well, as far as total evidence goes, at least part of the story is already told that we can do Jeffrey conditionalization. We don't require total evidence. We don't require to uh, probabilities of one or another. Sorry, but who can provide for this in the I'm simply not aware of precisely what you mean by conditionalization. It means moving from an early probability distribution to a later probability distribution where the difference is simply that you've conditioned on the evidence observed. So it's defined by that equation I have before. P prime of H equals P of H given E. Or, or more and more generally, P prime of dot, so anything, <coughs> equals P of dot given E. So one interpretation you gave is that your belief in the evidence is close to one. But is there any yeah. other possibility where you're not sure of the evidence is you want to understand that anyway? I, if, if the probability isn't close to one, then it's probably extremely dangerous to condition because you can never recover um, a lower probability than one of each. The reason I guess I'm confused is that if I understand the probability in the Cox, James, and so on tradition, yep. it's always implicit that whatever conditional probabilities you write down are always conditioned on the, all the information you put in. And so that is always there. You may not write it out, but it's always there. So if you've added this evidence, and this has updated your probability distribution, it is still there. But it's, it's, there, it's there in the sense that once you've done your conditionalization, you, you can determine a new probability for E, and it's one. And it's always going to be one. Once you get you know, these sticky endpoints, once you get to one or zero, you can never budge. So that's why it's there. Right, so I accept E as information that was specified. Yeah, so it becomes embedded in the distribution, so to speak, as opposed to just something the distribution ranges over. Sure. Yeah. Okay. We're not disagreeing. So maybe I can move on. But you seem to be saying that you can't do that. Well, I'm saying that that uh, only in the most extreme cases is it actually reasonable to give a probability of one to a piece of evidence. I agree. OK, so we're agreeing all over the place. <laughs> so if you stop agreeing out loud, we can move a little faster. OK, so where do the prior, where do the prior probabilities come from? Um, well, this is my, my first preferred sort of prior probabilities. Evolution has done a good, pretty good job of tuning us to, well, what used to be our environment anyway. And so um, the priors that are genetically coded for in our brains, uh, are, they're certainly there, and, and we use them, and that's great. Um, observed frequencies can be used for uh, as a source of probabilities. Reichenbach uh, was either famous or infamous, depending on your point of view, for a straight rule. So if you see, in other words, if you have a, a long string of events that are similar enough to each other, you get a frequency that's not bouncing around crazily, then you accept the frequency as, as a kind of a approximate probability. Um, we can also derive things from theory, whether it's quantum mechanics or population genetics. They will make assertions like this, which is saying that there's a physical probability, CH is for chance, there's a physical probability or chance, some event, identified as C, well, if you come to fully believe that theory and its assertion there, then clearly the subjective probability we should give to E is also C. So there's no incompatibility between physical probability and subjective probability. To the extent that we believe our physical theory, um, we simply adopt probabilities out of it as our own subjective probabilities. There are other possible sources of prior probabilities. So Shannon's law relating coding side Coding size and probability and a code book for your hypothesis space and the evidence space can immediately give you um, probabilities. And, and even as a last resort, I'm willing to go with max ends if I can't think of anything else. Um, Bayesians, I think, ought to acknowledge that learning can be complex and move beyond strict Bayesian principles. So we can learn with uncertainty via Je Jeffrey conditionalization. And we're going to need a supplementary story about the generation of new conditional probabilities um, under, under a whole host of circumstances. Suppose we generate a completely new theory that no one ever thought of before. Well, before anyone thought of it, we can't have had a specific prior for it. That's absurd. Um, so we have to have some alternative story that's not strictly justified in Bayesian terms for um, deriving probabilities for brand new theories. OK, physical probabilities. Um, the idea really starts with Aristotle, talked about what usually happens. Then came along, Phonesis came along, 
Um, I don't think there's any reasonable ground for, for dismissing this stuff, actually. It's not subjective, no, but of course, just as with the, um, Lewis's principal principle, if, if we get enough evidence about a certain sort of event occurring with a certain frequency under certain circumstances over and over again, eventually even the most ornery basin is going to say, well, gee, that's got to have something to do with the probability. So, in any event, the von Mises rule, as, as modified by Alonzo Church, provably satisfies the Kolmogorov axioms. So you can't reasonably deny that there are probabilities. Um, of course, it does require, hypothetically, an infinite sequence. Um, so what do you say about that? Well, what I say is that it's, it's, this account is actually just Popper's propensity account. That requires a chance setup, which is invariable. Um, chance setups do vary. So all you can really talk about is a hypothetical chance setup that doesn't vary, or in other words, uh, an infinite sample from a particular chance setup. Okay, well, even if the world is deterministic, and all physical probabilities are zero and one, it still makes sense to talk about the probability of rain tomorrow being other than zero or one, relative to, of course, the information in our heads. So, I think it's perfectly fair to adopt both interpretations of probability simultaneously. And, and as an AI person working on Bayesian nets, I'm, I'm, I'm almost bound to be that sort of eclectic. The, the technology is, is certainly not partisan. You can use it on anything, just like you can use the probability calculus on anything. Okay, so the next part here is, is meant to motivate non-Bayesian step probabilities. Thinking about probabilities is important. Um, you've probably been exposed to the cognitive psychology of, of poor human probabilistic updating. So this is really just an example of that. People focus on likelihood rather than probability. In particular, people have a tendency to ignore prior probabilities. And maybe this is where some orthodox stats uh, gets its, uh, its intuitive support, because ignoring them or treating them as uniform, or, uh, uniform prior probabilities or whatever tends to, be, uh, tends to lead you to orthodox conclusions. OK, so this is supposedly hard. It is pretty hard for most people. Um, dealing with uh, fractions is just awkward. People like to deal with whole numbers, so that's why Gigerenzer came up with an alternative that's a whole lot more um, intuitive and easier for, for uh, people to use. So basically, you just multiply the numbers so that they no longer become have, have uh, fractional components, and, and then it's pretty easy to see what the probabilities are. But the easiest way is this. Here, once you plug the numbers in, initial numbers in, which are given in the story, always get this one of these talks out. Um, studies, then you just crank the handle and the Bayesian network tells you the answer. It's magic. Okay, so the next part of this talk, uh, I think, uh, how much time have I got? About uh, 20 minutes. Okay. 15 or 20. So I'll just go through this next part really quickly. In, in <coughs> the history of AI, um, uncertainty in AI, um, it begins I guess in the 50s and 60s, when, when probabilistic reasoning was taken seriously, people did implement some <coughs> very limited forms of probabilistic reasoning. Um, but the whole thing, of course, is computationally complex. It's still computationally complex. That doesn't change with time. Uh, but Bayesian nets make it more um, practically manageable. But at the time, they didn't have Bayesian nets. So they limited themselves to, in effect, to what was uh, called at some subsequent point idiot Bayes. Nowadays, it's the very same structures are called naive Bayes structures. Um, so I'll give some example in my third lecture, in fact. Um, but the basic idea is you, you have, for example, a disease and some symptoms hanging off the disease. And what you pretend is that the symptoms are independent of each other given the disease. So you get very simple probabilistic structures that are easy to, to, to work with. Um, so in particular, uh, you assume that no arc can exist from X-ray to cough as two symptoms and so on. But it turns out that uh, aside from a fairly limited number of medical applications, uh, it, it didn't do a very good job. Is it like based what's used in spam programs and things like that these days? Uh, yeah, spam filters. Yeah, the, the first effective spam filter was an I-Bayes filter. Um, so here's an I-Bayes model. Um, 
heart attack by 60, blood pressure 50, exercise of 40, diet 50. So you have these symptoms, uh, not symptoms actually, these are causes. <laughs> so part of, the, part of the moral story is that this is not a causal model, this is an anti-causal model. But in any event, you can use observations of these things in order to do Bayesian updating and, and get a new distribution on heart attack at 60. It's very simple. Um, are these things independent given the future state of, of somebody's health? Uh, well, probably not. Um, but it might work for, for common purposes. That is, if, it's, if the dependencies are not terribly strong across the symptoms, then it works pretty well. So fast, simple, and gives good predictions on simple problems, as long as the implied independencies are approximately correct. So there's a lot of research now on, on so-called semi naive Bayes, where you, you start introducing certain limited numbers of dependencies to do better on harder problems. Um, but another alternative is to look at full Bayesian networks with no restrictions on, on the structure. Um, but I'll talk about that tomorrow. OK, in AI history, there are lots of ways of uh, evading the complexity of probabilistic updating. So due to Hart and Nilsson, they, they uh, they introduced a system of updating, which they claimed was effectively probability theory, but in fact it wasn't. It used minimum, min and maxes for, for combinations, and, and they don't work, as we know, from looking at fuzzy logic, right? Okay, so certainty factors were another one that was promoted for a long time, 70s through 80s, and, and so on. And, and in, in my, my, my mind, they, they died a, horrible flaming death in 1986, but they still carried on in practice for another 10 years. But anyway, it's all been overtaken by Bayesian networks by now. So, introducing Bayesian networks there. More generally, cause, causal models, sorry, graphical models, and more specifically, causal models. Um, so, these started out a long time ago, in fact. So, Wigmore was using charts for legal reasoning, which um, are arguably a kind of precursor to Bayesian networks. So Wright actually invented Bayesian networks, if you like. In 1921, there are path models, there are normalized um, linear equation models, and, and the fabulous, just really useful. And, and a lot of the rules that So Wright derived for, making, for analyzing these path models um, correspond to rules for analyzing Bayesian networks. And then there are all these developments through the 20th century, and, and eventually uh, Bayesian networks. So what, what Bayesian networks really add to, to this story? is that all of these things are hand-cranked. I mean, you have a piece of paper, you have a pencil, maybe you have a calculator, and you mess, mess around and, and come up with some, some way of fitting parameters or something like that. But the Bayesian networks, they, they came up with, in the 80s, algorithms for doing this stuff automatically um, that are really <coughs> effective. So, so that's the difference. OK, um, in order to understand Bayesian networks, it's really all about representing probabilistic dependencies and independencies. And I'm going to get into that by way of causality. So Nalza raised the question and then refused to answer it, leaving it to me. What's the relation between dependency and causality? He said that they're not the same, but he didn't say what they are. Well, of course they're not the same. But I go with Hans Reichenbach. He said, effectively, this is what he said, it's my paraphrase, when there is an enduring correlation between two types of events, then there is an underlying causal explanation. This does not mean that there's a naive causal explanation which says the two events are directly causally related. That's what it doesn't mean. What it does mean is that there's a causal network which relates the two and explains the correlation. Another way of putting it is where there's smoke, there's fire, informally, or the orthodox statisticians have it exactly backwards. That's another way of putting it. So, the main story about the relation between causality and dependency can be told in, in three chains like this. That is, um, subnetworks where you have A, B, and C. Uh, if you don't look at orientation of the arcs, then it's, it's simply a chain. So of that, there are three interesting cases. One is where it actually is a chain. So if you're looking at the orientation of the arcs, then it goes from A to B to C. And in that case, if that's the causal structure, a stochastic causal structure that's giving rise to, to data, then the data are going to reflect these probabilistic dependencies or independencies. Well, first of all, marginally, A and C are going to be dependent on each other, right? A is going to cause B, B is going to cause C, and that will be a dependency. Um, but the interesting point is that when you observe B, when you condition on B, then you get an independence between the two endpoints. So that's what this 
This is the standard notation in Bayesian netland for that sort of conditional independence. So A and C are conditionally independent given B. Okay, lots of examples. Um, there's also a common causal structure. So instead of B, instead of there being a, a directed chain through B, there can be a common cause of B causing both A and C. So in that case, marginally, B is going to correlate A and C for you, so they will be marginally correlated. But when you observe the common cause or ancestor, then, then in, in philosophers like to use the phrase screening off. It screens A off from C. So you get this, again, conditional independence. And the third relation of interest is where A and C are jointly causing B. Now in this case, you get exactly the opposite dependency structure. So marginally, A and C, at least in the subnetwork, are unrelated. But when you observe B, that establishes a relationship between them. So they're conditionally dependent. So this is often called explaining away. Because if you, if you have B observed, you know that some symptom is there, say. Um, but that's going to raise the probability of both A and C if they're, if they're diseases. Suppose that someone tells you that this person has disease A. Well, that will lower the probability of C because you've explained it away. So we can call these dependency signatures. There's a signature of marginal independence, conditional, sorry, marginal dependence, conditional independence, which is common cause or chain, and, and then the opposite for a common effect or a collision. So that's key for causal discovery, as I'll explain tomorrow. So just, um, just for the mechanics, what is a Bayesian network anyway? Um, it's, it's a network, a directed acyclic network of connecting random variables. So each node has a conditional probability function relating it to its parents. And so those are the parameters of the network. And it's directed in acyclic. So given that, then, given such a network, given such parameters, then the many Bayesian network tools that have been developed in the last 20 years can uh, go ahead and do updating for you. They will either do it in a deterministic, uh, deterministic algorithm, such as message passing with junction tree formation and stuff like that, in case you don't know what that means. Um, or if it's complicated enough, you probably would want to start going into stochastic sampling techniques to get um, approximate update. You can also update locally in subnetworks, ignoring parts of the network. There are all kinds of techniques employed to cope with complexity. So this is an example from Judea Pearl's uh, book. It's about his own house in LA. It has an alarm because there are lots of burglaries. And so this is a, a simplified <coughs> account of what's going on with this alarm system. So the alarm can be triggered either by burglaries or by earthquake or by random noise. And uh, if it is triggered, then according to, to Pearl, he has uh, neighboring friends who will call him up and let him know so that he can rush back and, uh, and get attacked by the burglar. <laughs> OK, um, so the point is, then we have a network here. There are a lot of arcs that are not there. For every arc that isn't there, there's at least some probabilistic independence that is assumed to hold. So the fact that you have a non-dense, a fairly sparse network allows us to factorize the joint probability, which is certainly, in principle, exponentially complex in the number of variables, into some computation that's rather simpler than, than the brute force uh, computation. So in this case, for example, because of these independencies that I ran through in the three chains, right? When you observe alarm, these guys are independent. When you observe alarm, these guys are independent, and so on. Also, these guys are independent. So um, that allows you, by factorizing through alarm, right here, to very much simplify the computation of both Sarah and Jack Colin. So the overall complexity of the network um, might, in fact, even grow linearly, or anyway, sub-exponentially in the number of variables. So this is called the Markov condition, where, where the lack of an arc implies an independence. It doesn't have to be true, of course. You can have a network that doesn't satisfy the Markov condition. What that means is that you're missing some arcs. So you've got the wrong network for modeling your problem. OK, so like I said, they're both exact or deterministic and approximate uh, algorithms for updating. There are all kinds of them out there. There are all kinds of tools out there for doing it. So there are some free tools that are quite quite usable, like Genie from, from Pittsburgh. 
and, and then there's things like Hugin, which um, charge 30,000 bucks or something. If, if you're academic or whatever, you can get it cheaper, but still pretty expensive. So deseparation is the graphical correlate to conditional independence. So it corresponds exactly to the uh, Reichenbach considerations that I, I ran through. So if you have an observed node in the middle of a chain, then that path, at any rate, is deseparated. If you have no such observation, then it's deconnected, and so on. And like I said, those things are used um, to, to organize the update rules or to, in, in the algorithms. You can, of course, factorize in any total order you like through the variables, but it is not a matter of indifference. You can factorize. Here I, I'm factorizing. How am I doing? OK, uh, from Sarah, Jack. So, so against the call of the flow, if you like. Sarah, Jack, earthquake, burglary, alarm. And in the usual construction rules, the Perl construction rules, um, that will lead you to this network, which is quite a lot more complex. So you, you get very little of the savings of Markov, uh, uh, Markov property. You get very little representation of independence. And so you get a complex mess, which is going to be very close to the brute force computation. So nevertheless, this, of course, is going to represent the probability distribution just as well as the simpler one, in the sense that just, just as well, meaning just as accurately and so on. But, but not just as well in the sense of computational efficiency. It'll be a lot slower. Causal order yields simplicity. So there are a lot of Bayesian net technologists out there who say, well, What's so causal? There's nothing causal about Bayesian nets. And, and they're right, of course. But there is something causal about good Bayesian nets. Because they go, go, it goes together with simplicity. Not strictly improvably, but um, certainly intuitively. OK, so naive Bayesian nets are anti causal. The last alarm network is anti causal. So, of course, you have lots of non causal networks. But there are advantages to causality. They're more intuitive, they're easy to deal with, easier to explain to people easier to use, and more compact and efficient. Interventions can be reasoned about. So suppose you're dealing with an environmental management problem where you're talking about intervening by um, releasing water from a dam or something like that. Um, well, you can explicitly reason about that with a causal network. With a non-causal network, your interventions uh, represented in the normal way are simply going to mislead you. So again, I'll talk about that a bit more tomorrow. And they can be machine learned. So what, what causal discovery algorithms do is they produce causal networks. What's that, four minutes? OK, that's fine. I'm pretty, pretty close to wrapping up this part anyway. Um, OK, I'm going the wrong way. All right, so then I have a couple of examples. So I was, I was really close to wrapping up. A couple of examples uh, to talk about, if you like. So sugar cane, this is just a story. It's, it's just like a word problem or whatever. But given the story and given um, a certain amount of information or guesswork about uh, the parameters and so on, and you can build something like this Bayesian network to, to reason about sugar cane yields. I guess it is. Car buyer problem. You want, you want to buy a car and you want to avoid a peach or a lemon. So, so in this case, we have a decision network, not just a Bayesian network, but a Bayesian network that is instrumented also with a utility node. How valuable is it for you to spend $10,000 for a lousy car as opposed to $10,000 for a good car? And you have a bunch of tests that you can conduct, um, which might give you more information about the probability that it will turn out to be a good or bad car. So um, summary, Bayesian nets, you can perform Bayesian updating on any, that means operating Bayes theorem, because Bayes theorem is operating all the time in these things. Um, you can perform that on any available evidence in any direction and use any node as your outcome node, uh, getting, getting a posterior distribution to inform you about uh, what, the, what the probability of some event might be. Uh, they do so efficiently when possible. In the worst case, when it's fully dense, um, then the network is exponential in the same way brute force computation is. In the best case, where you get strictly a, a tree updating, then it's linear, a tree structure in your, in your network, then it's linear updating. And, but most cases are in between somewhere. OK, so that's the summary. And I'll just go on to mention what I won't get into because there isn't time. But the next talk is going to talk about, uh, going to be about dynamic Bayesian nets. But anyway, there are two extensions, if you like, of Bayesian networks that are very commonly used and useful. Decision networks um, add these decision nodes plus these utility nodes. 
So if you're, for example, wondering whether you should buy a certain kind of insurance, but well, then you have a probability that you'll need the insurance, you'll have a cost, an ongoing cost of paying the insurance, etc. So you can put into a decision node that you do or don't buy the insurance. You can put in the utility node the money cost of the insurance plus the money cost of, of getting ill or whatever your insurance is for. And, and then you can just operate a Bayesian network, a Bayesian decision network, in order to find the optimal decision. Dynamic Bayesian networks are for reasoning about um, how a process operates over time. The traditional dynamic Bayesian network has a static network, it's replicated, and then there are uh, temporal arcs connecting them. So typically, a node x sub 1 at time 1, a node x sub 2, the very same node at time 2, um, typically that would have an arc from the earlier time to the later time, so every node is informative uh, about its next state, typically. Not necessarily, though. It might be the case that some are omitted. Let me just show you a few quick examples. So this is all about utility theory, which I'm going to skip. So there's an example of a dynamic Bayesian network. So we have uh, aspirin, taking aspirin, having a severe reaction to the aspirin, the flu carries over, the flu fever carries over, etc. So that would be a pretty typical dynamic Bayesian network. Um, so one thing I'm doing in causal discovery that I won't be talking about tomorrow is, is looking at learning these things. So in effect, it's learning Bayesian networks, but with restrictions on what relations can, can obtain. So the simplest case is where these static networks in these different uh, time slots are strictly identical to each other across time. But I'm also interested in looking at non-stationary systems where, where it varies. So anyway, that's about all I had to say today. What, sir? What is causation in, in this problem? Here? In the language. Of oh, in the language. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, well, basically, I'm not going to answer your question. Uh, it's a hard problem defining and understanding what causation is. And I have attempted in, in some of my work to do that. Um, I have a paper in Arkentness, for example, if you're interested, for, for my particular answer. It relates causality to Bayesian networks in, in a particular way, in a certain metaphysics of causality. Um, the, the basic idea is that causality in, in, in the philosophy of science literature, causality has two aspects which I think are both important. They've generally been treated separately, but I think they need to be merged. So one is um, causality is one variable making a difference to a subsequent variable. I think that's important. If it makes no difference, then, then there isn't any causal relation. Another is that there, there should be some underlying physical process that connects the two events or types of events. So I think really what you need is both. And so ideally, a causal Bayesian network is one where every arc reflects an actual physical process, something that can carry information from one space-time region to another. Or it reflects the possibility of such a process, even if the process doesn't exist. So that's that's the position I put in the campus paper. So if you're interested, that's 2008, and the lead author is Toby Hanfield. One of my collaborators. Yes. So you know, there is this whole business of the two calculus from. Yeah. I'll talk a bit about that tomorrow. Yeah. But let's take that up tomorrow. Um, I think the new calculus is. I mean, it's okay as far as it goes, but it's an incredible simplification. Anything else? Yeah, let's turn. Okay. Uh, yeah, I just want to uh, ask that. So you, you mentioned earlier on about uh, alternatives to probability theory, such as fuzzy logic. And so I was wondering if you think you mentioned there are certain cases where you can prove them to be incorrect by right, yes. certain circumstances. So I was wondering, just for the audience, do you have that, an example of that where fuzzy logic, for example? Yeah, well, you're taking mins and maxes to combine things and so on. So if you have. I, I gave one example with the Duda case, right? If it's, Tomorrow, if the states are, are either rainy or shiny, and, and you have a probability 0.5 of either, then you look at the probability conjunction or the disjunction, it's, it's clear that it's gone wrong, because it's neither min nor max. I mean, if, if it's exclusive and exhaustive, and you're looking at or, it's got to be one. I mean, come on. Similarly, the logic also. Sorry? Yeah, yeah, it has, they, they have similar problems. The, the curious thing about fuzzy logic is, is that in, in my washing machine it works fine. <laughs>
<laughs> I, I don't care about that. I'm, I'm a pragmatist. I'm, I'm happy to accept whatever works, but that doesn't mean I have to believe what it's saying or how it explains what it's doing. How to find out the connectivity of the network? Sorry? The connectivity of the network, so how to find out? The connectivity? Yeah. Um, yeah, well, that, I'll talk about that tomorrow because basically causal discovery is what that does. Causal discovery looks at probabilistic dependencies and from that it infers a most likely model to explain those dependencies. Causal model. So all the, the software that you mentioned, they all assume a given graph structure and then they'll learn the, the, the conditional probabilities? No, 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 no. The, the, the Bayesian network tools, um, the basic Bayesian network tools allow you to build any Bayesian network you like with structure and with parameters, and then it will do all the inference for you. And the, the basic Bayesian network tools don't do learning. But but they all want more and more of the marketplace, so they add in parameter learning with simple max likelihood procedures, and, and some of them are adding in basic causal discovery algorithms that I'll talk about tomorrow. So so they expand, but the origin of them is simply to do the updating. So so the, the, the classical way of dealing with them actually is to is to have your basic network tool, have your so-called knowledge engineer, a guy like me, and then have some expert who actually knows something about reality. And then I interrogate this, this guy to say, well, if A is such and such a value, then what, what happens to the distribution over B? And he tells me, and then I go and make a little Bayesian net that will do that. And then we, we operate that. And once we're happy with it, we give it back to him and charge him 10,000 bucks. <laughs> okay, so before Kevin charges me 10,000 bucks for it, <laughs> we'll uh, thank him and get more for tomorrow. Uh, we'll move on to...